Howdy, welcome back. Uh, it's been a while, I'm glad to be back. Been on hiatus, been on sabbatical for a couple months. Caught the Rona, uh, got some family matters straight, worked on some new material, doing a lot of stuff. So it's been uh, a nice absence, but I'm ready to be back. I'm ready to talk some football. I'm ready to talk some, actually some uh, campus politics, NIL, basketball, football, um, uh, spring and, and baseball as well. This is gonna be a little bit longer one, so buckle up, we're gonna have some fun. We need to look at what's gonna happen this spring with positions, offense and defense. So we're gonna look at that pretty closely. Uh, then we're gonna throw it over to uh, talk about some of the stuff on the campus currently, uh, a little bit of stuff with the campus culture, President Banks, you may have heard some of this stuff that's going on. And then uh, we'll kind of talk about the, the, the basketball team who got a huge win today over Florida. And uh, we'll do all the things. Yeah. So, hey, if you haven't yet, like and subscribe um, and uh, see what you think with the podcast tonight. I think we got a lot to talk about. So let's kind of jump in. And I want to address the elephant in the room first, which is that we're going to be without Demas. Demas got hit for a domestic assault charge. What do you say? Um, I, I just hope for this guy, this is gonna, this is, you know, I guess this is an alleged charge at this point. It doesn't look good from the details that I've seen. Uh, we were thinking, and I was thinking that this was gonna be number one receiver material this coming up season. That's not, that's not gonna happen at this point. So um, I don't see how anything else would not stick and this is huge letdown. I just hope for this guy, this helps him get his life straight, helps the uh, alleged victim uh, get things right. And I guess that's as much as I can say on this right now. You know, it's just an awful situation to think about. Um, uh, so much talent, but there's more to talent than, uh, there's more to life in football than talent. So that is what it is. Um, with that said, let's start with the wide receiver spot with Demas out. Uh, who are we likely to put in this spot? And I'll tell you who I've got starting off with. I think we all agree, and I want to hit the, the, the people that I think are, are dead locks first, Anaya Smith. Although, I will say this because um, I want to also try and hit the places that I don't think are, you know, or maybe are spots that I'm going to get wrong. I said Anias was going to be a staple this last year in... There's a lot of drop balls. There's a lot of missed assignments. I think he's going into um, a key year for him, so I think he's probably going to clear a lot of that stuff up. Um, but I do think he's going to be there, even though maybe somebody sneaks in and takes it. I doubt it. I doubt it. Probably going to happen in some other spots. Opposite of him, you're probably thinking, I'm thinking uh, Chapman. But Chapman's been so injury prone. What, what, what are we going to do there? It's tough to say. Um, could somebody like Moose fit in there? I don't know. Um, Demas was going to be a great replacement, but he's gone. And that was probably who I had for uh, his backup, if not starter. And with their situation, it would probably work really great hand in hand. Good news is Evan Stewart seems like he's coming along amazingly. Uh, high praise for that guy. A um, couple points more for him later on NIL, but. If that guy can slip in there and, and give us give us something there, I think we really may have the workings of a really nice wide receiver core this year. We had Chase Lane last year we thought was going to come in and really be a staple. Just didn't work out. I'm looking to see potentially Moose Muhammad break out, and I really like Jalen Preston. Jalen Preston looked like somebody that I could really get along with in that LSU game. He had a a couple really nice catches. I see him blocking all the time. I don't see him missing those blocks. Like I was saying earlier, Anias missed some key blocks this last year. Preston seems really solid. Seems like a, a role player um, that has the capability of making plays. I don't wanna like pigeonhole him in that, but you know, it's nice to have guys that would just be steady and be role players for you. So um, I'm, I'm really liking that guy. I think between those three guys, um, uh, hopefully Evan Stewart stepping in there, 
I could possibly also see maybe a Chris Marshall, but I don't believe he's on campus yet. So uh, with Evan being there, it gives him a little bit of a leg up. Moose and then Jalen Preston, I, I really like these three. Um, that's, that to me is a really solid group, but it's a little on the inexperienced side. You know, perhaps Moose didn't get a lot of playing time last year, neither did uh, Preston. And then Stewart would be fresh, you know. So that's going to be a challenge to see if that production can actually be there, even though it seems like the skill set is. Um, I mean, right next to that, it seems like tight end is the most obvious place to, to, to talk about. I think I gave a wrong impression last year and or, you know, I don't know, how do you predict these things? Watermeyer just wasn't quite the Watermeyer of the year before. He was still great. He was still very good. We had some drops, had some missed assignments, uh, blocking. Um, and that happens. It's going to happen. Um, and that might have had something to do with the quarterback situation as well. Same thing for Anias. Who's going to step up in this spot? That's a great question. Um, I think right now, if I'm going to have to uh, put somebody there, you know, we have Garza that came in, I believe, last year. Didn't really see a lot. We've been waiting on Cup to arrive. Is this going to be his year? I guess that's, that's up to him. There's going to be a large portion put on blocking for this position and not just the cashing part. Cup looks smooth. He did last year in, in the spring game, but that's got to translate on the field. Perhaps a Jake Johnson could come in and take this spot. He's on campus. He's practicing. Uh, he wants to do something. And maybe this is going to be the year of the Johnson. I don't know. We'll see what Max wants to do as well. That's, the, of course, the position everybody wants to talk about, uh, quarterback. So between Haynes King, Max Johnson, and uh, Wiegman, what are we looking at? Wiegman's the freshman coming in. Haynes King is not really the established guy because he only played a game and a half or a quarter last year, getting injured in the Colorado game. He looked probably less than stellar in the Kent State game, although had a pretty good box score. But, you know, anybody that watched that game probably just didn't think he looked that crisp. So what do you say? How do you come away with that? Um, Max coming in with a lot of experience. So this is going to be a very interesting race between these three guys. Um, I'm probably going to put, put Wiegman, um, you know, uh, third string at the moment. Makes sense. You know, Jimbo's playbook's pretty complicated. That, you know, as we've kind of learned, it takes a while to, to get a grasp on that. So that probably leaves the, the toss-up between Haynes King and Johnson. So we're going to see what's going to come of that. Um, might lend itself a little bit to uh, Max because he's a little bit bigger. We saw the injury last year. Maybe that'll play a part in his durability. Ultimately, it's probably going to come down to who can execute, uh, who can Jimbo trust, and who's going to do their job. Accuracy, all those things. So, Hanks King's going to have a small advantage because he's been in the system already. Max has got a lot of experience. If I had to roll with one guy, you know, it's, re it's really hard to say. Max is also a left-hander, whereas we've got um, Haynes King as the right-hander. Uh, maybe that affects, you know, our tackle positions as well. I think I'm going to... Wow, I've been mulling this one over for so long, I just don't know. I, I think I'm going to reserve the right to change this, but I am going to start with Haynes King. Um, I've heard that he's had quite the leadership role so far, and that means a lot to me um, for this offseason. So if he can get the guys around him uh, to play above their potential, that, that, that sounds like a winner for me. And so that's probably the, um, the, the safe bet at the moment, but could change, right? Um, Want to hit a couple of, uh, I think, obvious things. Uh, that are likely to take place in position wise, like almost no doubt. I don't think anybody's going to disagree because first off, just considering who we're missing, uh, we lost Jameer Johnson, right? Left tackle came in from Tennessee, uh, Kenyon green looking maybe to have a number one NFL draft pick out of him. Um, we, we lost Spiller, uh, our, our running back. And so we've got to replace those three. We had last year, Bryce Foster playing center and fathery playing right tackle. 
Um, I think those are no-brainers. I don't see anything else coming of that. Fotheries uh, participating in spring, Foster's not, but that's because of track and field. Uh, Foster's throwing shot and discus. Doing a pretty good job of it too, uh, but he's gonna he's gonna hold out, you know, this spring for that. Most obvious thing for replacement for Spiller is obviously a chain, and um, those are I think the three biggest no brainers. Right behind that is gonna be uh, Layden Robinson at right guard, and then we start to get a little a little. Uh, maybe controversial or fuzzy when it comes to left guard and left tackle. So I took some heat last year. I talked about possibly Trainer being a guy that was going to be a starter. And I don't know if technically he ended up starting, but his best game of the year was against Alabama at left guard. He struggled at tackle whenever he played there. And he's a 6'7", 330-pound dude. Um, he, can, he can move some stones. So I think left guard makes the most sense for him. So who is going to step up in that left left tackle spot, perhaps? And maybe some switching with Fothery, depending on if we've got a left-hander or a right-hander back there. I think, I mean, I, look, I hear Jimbo talking very highly of Aki. But where was he last year? He, he played some, and then he, he, he left, he was gone. What was the deal? Jimbo still seems to have a pretty high regard for him. Kind of a little confused by that one, to be quite honest. Um, I've heard that uh, Zoon is getting some looks at left tackle, which is good news. He, he came in the same class as Foster. Not quite as highly rated, of course, but a very quality, you know, 305 pound, I think somewhere in the 6'4", six, 6'5", uh, six, six, range. So good size. Good feet, seems to fit in that spot well, so maybe he wants to play that left tackle spot. Between these two, I think we got a really fantastic battle uh, that's going to be waged right there to find out who wants to take that spot. I think overall, out of all these spots, besides a chain taking over running back, I think I'm most encouraged probably by the offensive line because the way I see it is we've basically got four returners. I mean, if, if trainer's going to hit that left guard spot, he played a, a, a lot of snaps the previous year, um, and arguably there was times when I was like, why isn't he continuing to play? Like, he looked amazing against Alabama. Foster's a no-brainer. Layden Robinson, no-brainer. Whole right side of the line with Fothery, no-brainer. So we got three guys for sure. If you count Trainer, that's four. And then Zoom, uh, a blue-chip recruit. Can he step in there? Can he be as, as good as Jameer Johnson? Most people think that's probably going to be a, be a yes. So we're really maybe just replacing one guy there. They could protect the quarterback. We could open up the run game, get the ball to our receivers. We've got a nice recipe. So where could this go wrong? I've really been mulling this one over too when it comes to quarterback, offensive line, and running back, same way with the wide receivers. A chain, I think, is the best place to put this. Um, but I'm, I'm not worried about him. That's not what I mean. But I'm so confident in him that if he doesn't have the same sort of performance that I'm used to from him, that's an area that then could be like, okay, well, I missed the mark there. Now, that may mean he only has like a B-plus game instead of an A-plus game, which is still fantastic, but still, I think that's one, one area I could quite be missing it or maybe misleading myself on that. So I just want to give that to y'all as you're considering it, but... Right behind him, we've seen Amari Daniels run fantastic in the time that he's played. So has LJ Johnson. Uh, both really look like they fit the role of Spiller and what Chain have done the last couple years. Uh, the way they run behind the line, just it really looks like there's a lot of fluidity going between the young guys to or the, the veterans to the young guys. So looks like we've got a lot of stability going on there, which is in, in, encouraging. So I feel like we have a bit of a plug and play there, even if one's not. We're obviously going to see a lot of either LJ or Amari or both because the way it's been set up in the past, Spiller and a chain are, are kind of like a one-two. You might have first and second down for Spiller, and overall you kind of get a chain about you know some third down carries on average. But uh, regardless, we see the backup quite a bit in, in our system. So that's who I have currently. I, I w maybe 
Also, I could see a Donovan Green coming in and playing tight end. Uh, he's not on campus. He stayed home to play basketball. He wanted a state championship out of it. Just slightly missed it. Got to respect that guy for that decision, of course. Um, maybe he comes in, in the fall. He turns some heads. Uh, he picks up on the schemes quick. He's he's blocking. He's catching. Maybe that's the way it works out. Maybe we run a more of a too tight system, and we see see both of them. You know, we also got uh, uh, Orstrom coming in, which is a big guy as well. Great hands, and we took three tight ends this last class. So it'll be interesting to see what really you know kind of shakes out there. So transitioning over to defense. Let's start off with who we're going to be uh, we're trying to replace here. So we got in the very back, Leon O'Neill uh, going to the, uh, the combine. We also have uh, right in front of him, Hansford also going to the combine. Right in front of that, we're going to be replacing Jaden Peavy, uh, Leal, Clemens, and Tyree Johnson. So we're replacing essentially the whole whole defensive line. Now, of course, that comes with caveats because you've got McKinley Jackson, who's been basically a staple there for two years at least, I would say. He came in suspended last year, so we, we kind of thought he was going to be playing. And he didn't for uh, what the two-game suspension. Came in, played some good time, so he's there. Hopefully he's earned his tr that trust all the way back and we won't see any off-season issues. We really don't want to see any more off-season issues. So I feel like that's a fairly easy staple to put in there. Um, but I don't think it's the most obvious. I, I think we have a few other more obvious places that we on defense that we're going to have guys in there that are no-brainers. So let me just go down the top of the list. Uh, Antonio Johnson uh, playing at the nickel spot. Um, that guy, All-American caliber. I mean, that, that, that position... Uh, was probably one of the most important positions we have, finding him to play that position. That was a huge, huge find. That guy stepped up, and he's gonna, I can't imagine he doesn't do it this next year. Who else is going to be a staple and no-brainer? Tyreek Chappell. Um, freshman corner last year, lockdown guy. Looked like a veteran from almost day one. Um, and definitely probably pushed Jalen Jones quite a bit on the other side. Now, who are we going to have as another corner? I don't know. Um, I don't think that spot is a no-brainer. I do think Damani Richardson's a no-brainer, so uh, strong safety uh, opposite of Leon O'Neill, right, last year. So those are my, my three, uh, and actually there's, there's one more, but uh, Edron Cooper at linebacker, again for me, no-brainer. So those are my four, Edron Cooper, Tyreek Chappell, Damani Richardson, and Antonio Johnson. So... That leaves us seven spots, four on the defensive line to kind of shore up. We got a safety, we got a linebacker, and perhaps the other cornerback spot, right? So um, who are our candidates for that that are most reasonable? Jalen Jones, I'd probably give him a 90% chance of starting. But you know what? We, we, we brought in people like uh, uh, Denver Harris, five-star cornerback, uh, Killebrew. Uh, Bowie can actually play some some – uh, cornerback, uh, a DB, something along those lines. Perhaps he wants to come in there. Brian George is going to be uh, sitting out the spring, so that's an interesting development there. If he were going to take over one of those spots, I would have really liked to have seen him play. But what do you do? Spent basically all, I think, last season injured. Here we are missing spring. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to get in there. Chapman's also going to be sitting out this spring as well. I missed a couple of those others on the offensive side. Um, on the defensive side, Deuce Harmon also sitting out. Looks like a pretty special guy um, that he could replace uh, Leon. If it's not going to be him, he's sitting out the spring and somebody's going to pass him. Maybe it's somebody like Bryce Anderson. Remember the guy that was between us and Texas, committed I think early August? He's looking looking the part so far from what, I, what I'm seeing from uh, spring practice. So this guy is supposed to be one of the Potentially fastest on the team, good size, picks up the scheme, knows his assignments, and we may be also looking up an upgrade. Uh, so if he can fill that Leon spot and show up the backside with Damani, uh, all, all the better. That would probably be my pick at the moment if it's not going to be Deuce Harmon.
Um, so with Deuce missing, missing time, maybe, maybe he sneaks in there. Um, but we'll see. Um, right in front of that then um, is looking like uh, a linebacker situation. So if we've got Edron Cooper in one spot, to me the most obvious candidate for the other spot is Andre White. Um, he's had the most playing time. He's been around the longest. We picked up a couple nice guys, I think, in um, was it Ish Harris and Martrell Harris in linebacker spots. Both look promising, but again, they're going to be new. Are they going to have the same size that Andre White's got? That uh, you know that Aaron Hansford had? Probably not. So Andre probably fits better. Maybe Chris Russell. We'll see what, what that guy is looking like through the spring. Haven't heard much there. So at the moment, I'm going to default to Andre uh, because he's got the playing time. So, wow. So that's a lot. We have a lot to replace on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so let's let's work ourselves over to defensive line because we got a lot to, we got a lot to talk about there. Sorry about that. I had to, you know, wet my whistle. Um, always um, rye. Uh, tribute to uh, Captain McCall and Gus when they go into the saloon and, and Lonesome Dove in San Antonio right before they, they head up the Cal Drive. So always rye. Um, now, back to defensive line. So we've got to replace Leal. we got to replace Peavy, uh, Clemens, and Johnson. And I think somewhere in the nose tackle right guard situation we've got mckinley jackson all right great solid guy feel good about him uh, quality four-star recruit out of mississippi right next to him i've been back and forth on this last year i thought we were going to see more of darius jones he's a sophomore i believe last year should be a junior this year maybe we're going to see more of him but i'm probably going to side a little bit more with Isaiah Rakes. He played quite a bit last year. He looked, he looked really good to me in, in the time that he had. He's a big body. He can, he can really plug holes. He can, he can move people as well. So uh, maybe that's him. Now, we'd, we also saw Shamar Turner right around that area as well quite a few times. But, you know, we started kind of shying away from him, I think, once it got time to figure out whether or not we were going to be redshirting him, that sort of thing. I actually kind of think he might be a good candidate to move outside and take over Liel's spot. He's looking the part. He looks big. He looks strong. And um, I think an outside move makes the most sense. It, Rakes can't go outside. I don't, I don't see that happen. McKinley Jackson, they're, they're just not outside players. But Turner is lean enough and, and, and quick enough that outside for, for him makes a lot of sense. So... Him being the five-star recruit that we picked up the year before, I think that could that could fit really well, and he's chomping at the bit. So that leaves uh, opposite side defensive end. So this Tyree Johnson spot, if that we just replaced Clemens. So who's going to take over there? I think we've got about three solid candidates. I think we're looking at Fidel Diggs, maybe Jazion Harris, and Elijah Judy. Um, could maybe somebody like Anthony Lucas coming in take that spot or Shamar Stewart take that spot? I think it's a possibility. Um, but are we on campus yet? Are we playing yet? What kind of reps are we getting so far? You know, it, we'll have to see on that one. My bet right now is on Fidel Diggs. We saw him the most last year, uh, and he looked the part. He looked like a Tyree Johnson, and, and, you know, maybe just a, a Tyree Johnson light for a little bit, right? He doesn't have quite the experience, uh, but he looks like he's ready, wanting to step into that role and be that, that player. So left to right, I'm thinking Shamar Turner, um, Isaiah Rakes, uh, McKinley Jackson, and then uh, Fidel Diggs on the right side. Who are their backups going to be? I, we could definitely end up seeing a Walter Nolan right there in the middle left guard right behind Isaiah uh, Rakes, you know, filling in for McKinley Jackson. Uh, he's not on campus yet, so he'll have to pick that up in the fall. Um, we also have got a, a Gabriel Dendy five-star prospect that just came in, right? Um, 
Let's see, who else am I missing? Uh, we've got an Anai White. He could actually probably be a good spot for, for Edge over on the left side behind Shamar Turner. Um, the backups are looking really interesting. I find it odd, too, but also encouraging. We haven't really even started to talk about this year's class coming in. We, we did this last year where we talked about the incoming class a little bit later into the preview than we had in the previous year because we didn't have to as much because we've got more talent on campus. And we're not even really looking to replace anybody with this new class in, in a lot of spots. In a few, uh, yes, but it's not, it's not an inevitable thing. We don't have to, so there's a little small step of progress coming on there. So that's who I'm thinking for defensive end uh, and defensive line across the board there. And then again, recapping, probably Edrin Cooper, Andre White for linebacker, Tyreek Chappelle, probably Jalen Jones. Maybe somebody sneaks in there. But again, then Antonio Johnson for nickel, Damani for safety, and taking Leon's spot, maybe like a Deuce Harmon or Bryce uh, Anderson. So we'll, we'll see what shakes out. Special teams, I don't wanna leave out special teams this year. Uh, Seth Small's gone, um, so it looks most obvious for Caden Davis to step right on into his spot. Got a strong, strong leg, and we saw him a little bit, and he looks solid. Kickoffs are looking good as well, and then, of course, we're going to have Nick uh, doing punts, so that about shapes things up. Of course, we're not going to cover kickoff or return, but you can probably expect the chain to be back there some more. Um, and you'll Keith Brown for kickoff returns if we're talking about you know actual spots that you know we would maybe predict so those would be my predictions in those spots so switching gears though um, you know talking about that class that's coming in and this NIL NIL business you know this is uh, all this speculation it's just, just Maddening. It is absolutely maddening, is it not? Uh, you've gone through. You've heard about the thirty million. You heard Jimbo get on his his soapbox about this sliced bread business and this um, uh, whatever this uh, uh, site was that it came from. Who, uh, thirty million dollars? Right? Because that's what we paid. You know, I'm having trouble understanding how this logic plays out. How does it make sense that we bought this class? Somebody, please, 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 please tell me, um, and I'll and I'll wait quite a long time. So um, we had a top ten class the last three years. We've had a number three, uh, Aggies. You know that's a number three, not a number four, right? In 2019, a number six, a number eight. But we bought the class this year. Um, we beat Alabama this year but we bought this class. Uh, Walter Nolan, Shamar Stewart both said if they wanted to take money, they would have stayed home or done something else closer to where they were, but we bought this class. It, it doesn't make sense that lowly old Texas A&M, even though people are starting to give us some, 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 some props for some things that we've done, lowly old Texas A&M, we outbidded somebody? Who did we outbid? We, out, we outbid uh, USC for prospects? Texas? Come on, Texas. You've got a, what, a $12 billion um, dollar, um, endowment? Now, I said that just for the Longhorns watching this because, you know, they're thinking right now it's not $12 billion, is it? It's actually $42.9 billion because money is a, a situation right there. That's a big deal. How, we've got, the, I think, the $12 billion endowment. They've got the 42. How are we outbidding them? Doesn't make sense. We're all bidding Alabama. I mean, like one, what six or seven of the of the last ten national championships, we're out bidding them. What about Notre Dame? What about Michigan, Oklahoma? I mean, I know we've got money. That's not what I'm saying. The the fan base steps up when it's got to it got to be done. We 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 are committed. There's none more committed, I would say. But when you're talking about surely outbidding people, uh, you know, monetarily, I'm not seeing the the point there. You're saying we outbid all these other people? Nah, not buying it. Not even for a second. So another quick point, Evan Stewart, kind of known as a social butterfly. He's got like 250,000 Instagram followers. Why would he want to come 
to College Station when he could, you know, further his influence career at a place like Austin, Texas. That's a great place to get snapshots, right? You don't want to take Instagram photos next to a pasture, right? Because that's, that, that's what College Station is, right? We're just a pasture. Uh, you would be much better doing that with the sunsets over Congress Avenue looking out on Town Lake, wouldn't you? Hmm. One has to wonder. Maybe that seems like that makes an argument for we bought him to keep him from there, but it seems like he could make more money there. So again, that sort of goes against the monetary aspect. I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not here and I really don't care about it. Anyways, just wanted to say my piece and that's what that is. So um, with that said, I want to take a little sidestep. Um, this is channel is Aggie Central. It's not Aggie Sports Central. So I do want to talk about a couple things that are going on. I do keep up with things, at least politically, that may turn up for Aggieland. Um, so there's been a lot to do about President Banks recently. Um, are you aware of the audit that took place? When she arrived on campus, she had an audit done, third party audit. That audit cost money, which for me is something that just rubs me the wrong way. Audit was done, it's a third party, they make recommendations, they say this, they say that, and some things that, that they go through there. They identified a few things, um, and I won't, I won't rehash those, but it just threw up some red flags for me. They made a couple moves perhaps, and what this did to, from my perspective was it said, you know what, if I'm President Banks, third party's making the recommendation, so it's not me making the recommendation, so I don't really have to take the heat for it. Third party said to do it, so we should do it. Okay, so you can kind of see that. You don't really have to stand behind your decisions, and it, it, just, it just looks a little odd, okay? Um, you know, and I'm gonna, I'll take one step backwards for a second, right? Because I want to I wanna go back to Demas for a second because there's this overarching uh, idea that's going on here, okay? So what Demas did, um, if, if, if correct, was somehow assaulted uh, his girlfriend. That cannot be tolerated. That is intolerable. You don't allow that. This fits in with the Aggie Code of Honor. Okay, that's the, that's, that's the underlying and overarching idea that's going to be going throughout here, right? So uh, we don't tolerate, uh, Aggies do not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. What he did was he stole, he took something from her, if this is all true. That's not an Aggie way. So when Banks did this, it kind of threw up some red flags for me and it just feels like it's starting to become a little dishonest. I'm not, I'm not trying to allege that fully, but I'm keeping my eye on it, right? There's supposed to be some focuses on culture. And then if you haven't been apprised on this, there's, a, um, there's been some, 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 some things happen with the battalion and some overarching or some oversight with the battalion coming from higher ups they're supposed to be going away from, from any print media. And if you were like me, every time you got on the bus, you grabbed a bat, um, that sucker went in your backpack, you read it and you held it. You may even killed a few, few flies with it. You did what you, what you did, but you, you loved that bat. And I got that bat every week. They want to go away from that. She said, there will be no more print media, uh, verbatim. Um, and so when the paper is self-sustaining, because of the print and because of the ads, as reported by the battalion folks, why? What's, what's the purpose? So many people take in their, um, their news electronically. That is true, but not on this campus necessarily. When kids are walking around and they're, they're waiting at the bus stop, they're waiting for class, they grab a bat. Unless it's changed drastically, um, which is possible, but that's part of the culture that was going on uh, or, or that has been. And so that doesn't necessarily hold true when you're like, everybody consumes it. No, everybody does not consume it that way. Aggies in large part consume it 
through print media. All right, so this gets me back over to another situation. So we've been talking about you know the culture that's been going on at A and M, um, and that they're wanting to make you know maybe some changes are, are possible. And, and my question would be like, well, what changes do you want to make? And I, I ran into a guy today on uh, Twitter, and I'll quickly recap you know kind of what that looked like. I think he used to write for the Battalion, and so. Um, there's been some things going on. There's this other side, a side thing that the battalion revealed about some sort of rudder association. I haven't read up on that yet. You might want to see what's going on. As a matter of fact, I say you might because I, I would recommend it. Be in the know about what that is. Um, it seems like something that could be a bad deal, but I don't necessarily make up my mind that way yet. I want to get all the facts first, and then I want to make up my own mind. That's how I work. So I, I, I don't do that. But here's how the exchange went, and here's one of the things that was said and, uh, uh, by this character. So um, he was talking about this group and the Rudder Association and some things that they've said in their group that's been revealed through the bat. And then he goes on to say, Count me among the former students who believes in an Aggie land that accepts all. Diversity is a strength. Okay. Surface level, that sounds really fantastic, but there are some basic problems in there, okay? Again, I'm going to point out here, and we're going to get back to Demas, right? Aggieland believes in an Aggieland that accepts all. Do you accept Demas? Do you accept what he did? Is that something that you're going to tolerate? Because you said accepts all. Now, I know this may sound a little bit semantical, but it's part of the little bit of culture that's being degraded. Our culture is this, what it means to be an Aggie. And this is an ongoing discussion, I suppose, because I don't think this has as much to do with you being an Aggie, having one of these on your finger as it does for you to adhere to that honor code. Aggies don't lie, cheat, or steal. They don't do those, and he did one of those, and that makes him not an Aggie. That doesn't make him irredeemable, but right now, that's where it is, and that's a behavior that we don't tolerate. It doesn't mean it can't be rectified necessarily, but you don't also get the same privileges. We don't, we don't tolerate that. So if we don't tolerate that, then that does not mean that we include all. So we have a direct contradiction. Now, I pressed, right, because I'm not going to allow this sort of thinking going on because I'm so in tune to some of the other things that are going on and some of the things that, you know, we're going to have to fight for when it comes for this culture that we created. And so I say, you know, when you say accept all, do you mean those who lie, cheat, or steal? That's not only the bat, um, you know, that this is in context with the bat. So are we stronger if we are more diverse and accept those who lie, cheat, or steal? Because if you're going to be more diverse, like, like this guy is saying, then that means you're going to have a, a wider encompassing range of those that you include. So are you going to include the liars, the cheaters, and the stealers? Do you even know who they are? They're not going to come out and say it. They're going to nest themselves within other groups. But it, they're there. And you better be aware of it and don't think that they're not. That can't, that, those three core values cannot be eroded. We will cease to be A&M and Aggies if those three get eroded. And to say that we accept all is to lie. And that's not a, that's not a non-inclusive statement necessarily. Um, yes, it excludes, but it excludes on the basis of those core values. We should never, and we came to a great agreement in the end, we agree A&M should never exclude on those most uh, uncommutable, uh, you know, race, creed, uh, gender, sex, um, religion, ethnicity, all those things. You should never exclude based off of those things. But if you are a domestic assault, you, you need to be excluded. If you are whatever those other things are that you can insert blank here, there, exclude. We are not that, and those should not be included. So um, that's just something I'm keeping my eye on. I, I, I really encourage you to do the same thing because if we just let that kind of inch away little by little, 
eventually it's going to turn into something that we don't want it to be. So I'll give you more updates as, as it comes along. But because it affects agriculture, I thought it was really worth uh, taking some time here to do it. Um, and if you want to catch more of those exchanges, you can you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Uh, my handle is uh, ATM Cold Chills. Um, so um, nothing great. I, you know, put out a little bit here and there. You know, like to go back and forth. Uh, just trying to promote uh, positive Aggie stuff, and I believe that that Aggie culture is central uh, to this. So that's why I'm so so passionate about that part, and I hope you are too. So, all right, getting back, let's let's talk some other areas of sports. I've been wanting to do this. Um, of course, like I said, I've been on hiatus. So we've had uh, basketball going on. We have had uh, baseball startup. We have had track and field going on. We have had uh, softball startup, um, golf, swimming and diving, lots of stuff going on, right? So some of the big ones that we know, and I think we've got some interesting things to talk about because I really want to talk about, about buzz and the season that's going on. So we beat Florida Day on the last minute three. If you haven't checked that out, you got to go check it out. It was amazing. <laughs> it's all over Twitter. Uh, SEC Network is going to be on every highlight reel today. Uh, and, and, and they just really played kind of lights out. You know, the, the narrative throughout the, the season has been really kind of back and forth. Some people have been calling maybe for Buzz to go. Somebody has, you know, some have said, oh, he's fantastic. And as you can imagine, that just kind of shifts, shifts with, uh, with the wind a little bit. We start off hot. I think we ended up being 11 or 12 and 3 at one point and then went on an eight game skid. So you can imagine as we were 12 and 3, Buzz is the king of the world. Eight game skid. And it's what the hell are we doing? Last couple games, starting to look like a different team again. So it got me thinking. Um, he's in his third year. And when do you kind of go about thinking that you need to clamp down and think about firing somebody, letting them go, moving on from them, right? So interestingly enough, we've got Gary Blair's last year. And so this kind of, you know, comes into uh, uh, consideration to kind of understand when to maybe do this. Props to that guy. I, I think back to that 2010 season when we took that national championship, and I think it was we beat Notre Dame, right? One of the best games I feel like I've seen. Of course, who wouldn't say that when your team wins a national championship? But really and truly, it was so much fun watching that, and I'm so thankful that he gave that to us. From there, it seems like there's been a lot of years where there's just been underachievement. And here we are this year, and, and the team's just not the same, and it makes sense. And he, I guess my understanding is that this is on his own accord, so that makes things maybe a bit easier. Maybe there was some pressure, maybe not. Um, but with this, the, the talk of, you know, buzz, maybe needing to be let go from, you know, mad fan base, Gary gonna move on and retire this year. Uh, we just dropped Childress last year, and we bring in uh, Schloss. Makes me kind of think about, you know, how do you know when to let somebody go? I don't know if I've got a perfect answer for it yet, but I think what I want to forward is this at the moment. And I think part of it is, um, of course, wins and losses have a lot to do with that. But when it comes to not just being wins and losses, like for instance, obvious instances where this doesn't you know, work out in your first year of a tenure, you don't really look at wins and losses. So should you drop somebody you know, um, on their first year, let's say in basketball, if they only got five wins, say out of uh, 30 games probably not right because there there's there's more going on you understand the context so there's a lot of context taking place for me I think the secondary factor if not for wins and losses has to do with some sort of combination between um, urgency and the fire that you bring I think what I'd like to characterize this with is kind of looking to see how children's just seem and probably Gary Blair to a degree this year, the fire is just not quite there, that urgency. That urgency is just not quite there. I see it with Buzz, and that's why for me with Buzz, I've been satisfied all year long, whether or not he was winning or losing. And I'll tell you this, because there's something, there's a, big, there's a difference between having urgency, being fired up, and being frustrated. 
when that urgency and that fire starts to turn into kind of a frustration, I think we're starting to move that other direction. And because that, that's a, now we're starting to talk about a culture situation that could, that's going to happen. Right now, I think the culture with Buzz is, is, fa- is fantastic. Um, I don't sense the negativity that's going on. I don't say, wouldn't say I sense the, the negativity with, with like Gary Blair or something, but the urgency and the fire just not quite there. I don't think it was there with Childress either, and I think it was the right time. Um, Schloss is in his first year. They're off to a decent start. We'll see how that pans out. Um, but uh, sometimes with a, with a new change, uh, it's pretty obvious pretty quick. You either got a guy that's, that's moving on and is highly motivated or that's you know just looking for those extra few years on the contract before they're ready to retire and and hopefully it's the former Um, of course the longhorns aren't looking for the same quite same deal since it's not a head man but then just picking up gary patterson as a as an analyst you know maybe that's something that that turns into a defensive coordinator for them down the road because um, he's looking to reignite himself after a few uh, mediocre years so We'll see. I think another part of this is commitment, and the fan base right now has got a lot of commitment going on. We're, we're putting a lot of money in facilities, so we're expecting something. We're expecting something. We've updated, I think, softball. We've updated soccer. We've updated track and field. Now, that brings me over to a recent SEC indoor track and field finish. Men's seven, I think women's nine, or maybe switched on that. That's throwing up red flags for me. That's just, for me, that's not acceptable, and it's been sliding. We had a number of years that we took first. I'm not expecting that every year, but it seems like the urgency is not there. So Pat Henry's had an illustrious career. Uh, He's been going something like 35 years, I think. I would not be surprised if we kind of saw that starting to move that other direction. And if I had to predict somewhere else, I'm I'm starting to think... um, possibly Joe Evans for softball. Love both of these people to death, but you know, uh, and like it's the same way for, for Gary Blair. They've been staples in the programs and they've done such, such good jobs with, with, with our, our, our students and our, our, our student athletes, right? But in the end, you know, we're looking for an uptick if we're going to you know, put all this into it because we're, we're trying to give you what you need to be successful at another level. And if it's not happening, it's just not happening. And so we have to think about moving on. Uh, but I think those are my criteria. We'll see what shakes out with those, those spots. Um, hopeful for Schloss. We'll see what the men's tournament can do. They play again tomorrow. And uh, we're going to hopefully beat the hell out of Auburn there. And then move on to, I think, the semifinals on Saturday. And the uh, finals would be on Sunday. So that would be very interesting. And then Schloss, uh, we'll see. We'll see what the baseball team wants to do. Um, softball's off to a pretty good start this year. Um, in track, we're getting into the outdoor season now, and maybe maybe we'll do something better than uh, that 7-9. and nine. But uh, time will tell. Finally, hey, uh, spring game, April 9th. I think it's somewhere like right around 1.30. I'll be there. Come on out. That's going to be awesome. Let's you know take a look and see who's going to be out there together. I'll do a preview for you after that as well, or I should say a review, and uh, kind of compare and see what that looked like, give you my analysis. Um, and hopefully in the near future, we'll be giving you something out of left field coming up that will be something for your off season to keep you, keep you, keep you going since uh, recruiting has died down and we don't have any football other than spring. But We'll, we'll definitely be doing a little bit more basketball uh, and, and, and baseball as it, it's coming on and any other bigger updates, and I'll keep you updated on the culture as well. So, um, again, if you haven't already, go ahead and like and subscribe. Love to see you guys. Good to be back, and uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, and gig'em.